Hey everybody, so I just wanted to give you an online lecture for Lab 4, uh, Introduction to Agent-Based Modeling with NetLogo. Uh, I'm doing this because uh, depending on the schedule for the semester, sometimes it's more convenient for us to do uh, this lecture online than, um, or this lab online rather than actually have you doing it in lab. Um, but I really do think that agent-based modeling is something that is that industrial engineers should know a little bit about. So I, um, I'm hoping that uh, this at least gives you a little bit of exposure to this very different simulation methodology that um, still involves experimentation. And so it's definitely very similar to the stochastic simulation methods we'll use in the rest of the class, although the methodology, um, the, the agent-based modeling is very different than the discrete event system simulation work that we'll do, say, with Arena or FlexSim or Simio. And, um, now, I do want to mention that, say, a program like AnyLogic actually can do both the type of discrete event system simulation that we've been doing as well as the agent-based modeling that we do here. Uh, so um, if you use any logic in, um, in your career, then you'll probably bump up against agent-based modeling again. Um, also, depending on which uh, field you're in, some people call this individual-based modeling, and they're the same thing. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's move on forward. As I mentioned, agent-based modeling is also known as individual-based modeling. And um, in engineering, we often refer to multi-agent systems. Um, the distinction is that ABM and IBM are often um, trying to model a natural system, whereas in multi-agent systems, we're trying to design a system. So you find people in robotics will talk about multi-agent systems, and um, whereas people in biology, ecology, um, people in anthropology um, will refer to agent-based modeling or individual-based modeling. The biologists kind of use the individual-based modeling more, the social scientists more the agent-based modeling, and, um, but, uh, but then multi-agent systems comes in there too. But uh, to a first-order approximation, they're all identical. They only get different in the kind of nuances that are kind of beyond the scope of this class. All right, so in, um, if you want to look for some textbooks in this, here are two really great ones to start with. Um, the more traditional one uh, in the past is this one by Steve Railsback and Volker Grimm, Agent-Based Modeling and Individual-Based Modeling, a Practical Introduction that uses NetLogo, which you'll be introduced to in this lab. Uh, but uh, then a few years after that, the guys who actually uh, created Netlo NetLogo, uh, Yuri Walensky and Bill Rand, um, actually then created this Introduction to Agent-Based Modeling, which also uses NetLogo. So now these are sort of the two leading textbooks um, on using that logo for agent-based modeling, um, I would highly recommend uh, either one of them. Okay, agent-based modeling is a dynamic modeling framework, um, which um, means that the simulations that we run, we really do sort of pay attention to the transients. They, they have to run over long periods of time. Um, it's not like sort of a simple spreadsheet with a single output, although um, the data you collect might be at the end of a simulation, so you still can do the type of Monte Carlo simulations that you would do um, if you were, you know, trying to approximate pi with a Monte Carlo simulation. We still could do that. You may not care about everything that happens during the transient and the run, but uh, but still we view them as a dynamic modeling framework um, because uh, the the process of how things interact really does matter. Um, Usually, agent-based modeling uh, we think of as being stochastic, so uh, the agents move around in kind of a random way, and we're kind of interested in what emerges from that. But you certainly can have agent-based modelings that um, uh, agent-based models that are deterministic. You can have agent-based models implementing things like cellular automata and things like that. Uh, but um, but uh, generally, we view them as as kind of being stochastic. Uh, now, as we'll see in some of the models you'll use in the lab, you can have totally deterministic rules but still have stochastic outcomes. And so one of the bonus questions for this lab is uh, you'll run a model that has stochastic outcomes even though the rules are 100% deterministic. And the question is, what is the source of the randomness? So we'll get into that. A wide variety of agent-based modeling software packages available, like I mentioned, AnyLogic, NetLogo will use, Mason, uh, very popular among uh, certain communities. Uh, notice the MAS, Multi-Agent Systems. Um, also, there's another reason why they picked the name Mason. If you look up who wrote uh, the software package, maybe you can figure that out. Um, 
Repast and their version of NetLogo Relogo, Swarm, VizSim, there's just a bunch of them that do agent-based modeling. Uh, and um, they all have pros and cons. Uh, we're going to be focusing on that logo here, but I'm hoping you just sort of get the general idea so you could pick up one of these other ones. If you really like kind of Java-based frameworks, you know, try Repast. NetLogo is kind of nice because you can come at it uh, as sort of being agnostic to programming. At least that's kind of the hope here. Um, NetLogo should be available on the lab computers in SIDC. Um, if not, you can use these, uh, these links here that allow you to download NetLogo to your Linux, Windows, or Mac machine. You can actually run NetLogo um, totally inside your web browser. And you can even, the models that you run, you can even edit inside the web browser and rerun them. So that's kind of cool, um, although they don't get saved. So, but what's nice about that is if you build a model inside NetLogo and you want to export it to, for someone else to look at, you don't have to depend on them downloading NetLogo. You can just save your model on a web server somewhere and then give somebody access to that URL. Or you could even just email them the, um, the, the HTML file that comes out of NetLogo and they can run it inside their local web browser. And even though they don't have NetLogo installed, they can still run your model and even do a little modifying of it. So what does NetLogo look like? I took a screenshot here. Um, I'm also uh, periodically going to just open NetLogo up. So I've got NetLogo 604 here. So, um, and uh, depending on if you're running a Windows or uh, Mac or Linux machine, things might look a little different, but basically everything's in roughly the same place here. If I go to the file menu, I can see there's this models, models library. Um, I can see uh, recent files. Um, uh, this upload to modeling commons. So if you come up with a really cool model, you can actually contribute it to a commons for other people to download it and, and use. Um, and then I actually have a way to, uh, if I get really advanced, I can generate um, uh, auxiliary files that I can import and export in and out of different models. So all that's inside here. We're going to focus really on the models library. That's what we're kind of uh, used to uh, generate um, the um, to generate to, to uh, we're going to use models that have already been built for us um, so that we have them to play with rather than um, having you build your own model from scratch just yet. All right, so that's where you find that in the models library. Now, if we open up a model, so I'm going to go into NetLogo and I'll go into the models library and I will pick a model um, like. Uh, if I go in and I, let's say I want to look at uh, biology and then I pick this ants model. All right, so if I click open there, it takes a second to open and load, but then I end up getting the model loaded and um, this is the interface of the model, so I could actually run in this model, but I can also go over the info to figure out how it works and um, they have taken the time to actually give me a description of the model and how it works, how to, um, you know, sort of interesting things I might notice, um, and also sort of information about um, how they came up with this model, where it came from, those sorts of things. So for the models in the models library, all of this info is populated. And if you ever build a NetLogo model you want to export to someone else, you should populate this and nice and document uh, your code and how to use it. If you're interested in seeing the code, you can go to this code tab and then you can actually um, uh, see all of the code and actually edit the code and, uh, and, after, and then go back to the interface when you're done editing and, and run it. So that's what we get to in this presentation. You go over to the code tab and you can actually look at the code and uh, edit it. You'll notice the syntax is a little different than you might be used to and uh, we'll maybe get into that. So uh, if you need help, uh, there's a help menu and if I go into the NetLogo dictionary I'll actually open up a web browser and um, in that web browser brings you to actually a local web page uh, that actually has everything stored locally but if you were to Google for NetLogo dictionary you could actually find this stuff stored online and all of the different commands that you can use in NetLogo are in here they're all grouped um, in these categories that will make sense if you start using that logo um, and then you can find whatever you're interested in and read more about it and uh, the see also bring you to other things 
and so that's great. But then if you look down the left-hand side, there's even this nice tutorial, which um, is a great way to start with NetLogo, is to just go through the tutorial. If this was a more in-depth class, I might even make that a lab, is to go through the tutorial or to check out the commands and procedures. Um, they've got a reference guide, which has all sorts of other info. Um, tells you about features of NetLogo, uh, like how to use the shapes editor to, um, to either make use of or draw your own new shapes, how to do more advanced things, and so on. Um, extensions to NetLogo. NetLogo is actually extendable, so some of you might be familiar with geographic information systems, so that's kind of an interesting growing area, is the combination of agent-based modeling and geographic information systems together, and you can do that inside NetLogo, and this will tell you all about it. Um, so all those are beyond the kind of scope of this class. So um, we are not going to worry about those right now. Okay, so in summary, there are a wide variety of NetLogo resources on the web and also bundled with NetLogo. And uh, the help menu is a good uh, gateway to finding some of those. Um, also within NetLogo are a number of tools that of course you'll use during the simulation. Um, not only writing the simulation, but also running the simulation. So as one example of that, um, agent-based models uh, typically have outputs that are stochastic, that are, are random outputs. What, what I mean by that is if you run the same simulation over and over and over again, you'll typically get uh, outputs which are different, even though maybe your parameters that you put into the simulation are the same. And so because of that, typically to make any conclusions about your simulation outputs, you have to run a very many simulations, even if you don't change the parameters. And so rather than doing that all by hand, NetLogo has what uh, this tool that they, they call Behavior Space, which helps automate the running of these experiments. And, uh, and so in Behavior Space, so if I can, I'll make him pop over to NetLogo. So pop, open up NetLogo again here. And in Behavior Space, uh, you effectively, if you've ever done a design of experiments in any of your classes, you can set up NetLogo to do a full factorial design of a number of different levels that you want in your sim. So if I, um, I'll just open up a, a model here again in NetLogo. So say biology ants again. If I go to tools, once the ants loads. If I find behavior space under tools down here, I can create a new experiment. And then inside this experiment, you can see that all of the sliders, so the parameters I can change, um, end up showing up inside the, uh, this behavior space here with whatever values are currently set. But then I can go in and I can say, well, I actually don't only want to run an evaporation rate of 10. I might want to run 10, uh, 30, 70, and 100. And, um, and it will run all of those evaporation rates crossed with all of whatever these levels are. So um, if I could say, well, and I also want to see a population of 200 and a diffusion rate of 75. So in that case, it'll run 10 with 125 and 50. It'll also run 10 with 200 and 50. And it'll run 10 with 125 and 75 and so on. So it does the full factorial design of all of these different levels. And there's even shorthands here for ranges. And so um, you can even say, well, okay, what if I actually want um, uh, to run from 10 in steps of 10 all the way up to 100. Well, that right there is a shorthand for me writing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And, uh, and then, but then this still can be just a simple list of two. So for each one of those parameter settings, you can set the number of repetitions. So I could set that equal to 10. So that would mean that, uh, that if uh, I set the evaporation rate to 10, population to 125, the diffusion rate to 50, it would run 10 uh, replications of that. And then, so in my output file, I would end up seeing that parameter set repeated 10 times with 10 different outputs. So, um, so that automates all of that for you, which is really nice. And, uh, and you can end up um, 
you can choose what you want to measure. You can choose, so you can put different what they call reporters in here, which just allow you to measure multiple things. Um, and you can choose whether to measure them at every step of the simulation or only at the end. Uh, then it's got these other little boxes down here. These are um, a procedure that has all the commands that were run uh, whenever you set up a new repetition. So whenever, whenever it sets up a new run of the sim, um, this, these are the commands that actually are executed every step of the sim. Um, you can stop at a given time. So you can say only run to a thousand steps, or you can pick a stop condition and you can say only run until the stop condition is met. Or in your sim, you can tell the sim to end at a certain time. And if neither of these are met, but your sim has some logic that kills itself, then, uh, then that will also stop the sim. So there's three different ways you can stop a replication. And you have to make sure that at least one of them is definitely going to happen or else this automated experimenter is just going to run forever. And then uh, after every replication is done, you can also put a, some code in here to do some processing of your data, um, you know, whatever that might be. So this tries to automate the things for you so it makes it relatively painless. And so it's a, a really useful tool we'll come back to here uh, in a more concrete example. So sort of a summary of all the interesting things you can do inside behavior space. All right, so what are we going to do today in the lab? Well, so this is an individual lab. Do this on your own. If, uh, if you attended an in-class um, uh, a, a lab session, then of course there's a ticket out. If, if not, then, uh, then there's, there's no specific ticket out. Um, although we may ask some questions after this, uh, th this, um, this lecture here uh, that you'll answer online. But, uh, but there's two parts, and I basically want you to look at two different models from the models library and do a couple of different things with them to kind of exercise net logo a bit. So the first case, let's go, and I want you to open up the segregation model, which is in the models library under social science. So and go back into net logo, and I will go into models library. I look under sample models and then social science, and then I find segregation. Now, interesting point um, here. If you notice that in the the, the lab slides, um, I uh, when I op took a screen grab there, the segregation model was red and green. Now, the new segregation model in this newer version of uh, NetLogo is this kind of blue and orange, and uh, and so. This is kind of an interesting uh, you know, point here that the, the function of the segregation model hasn't changed, but the colors have. And you think, well, why would it matter what the colors have? Right now, there's actually a movement to make technical documentation much more friendly to those with different forms of color blindness. And so you can actually find color palettes out there that um, are ensured to be meaningful to a very, very wide uh, 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 as wide of a range of people as you can think uh, of. Um, so they're sort of pick colors that make sure that they don't um, trigger any ambiguity that might be caused by any particular type of color blindness. And so I think that's the reason why in this newer version of the segregation model, they've gotten rid of the red and green and, um, and even you know, maybe started to involve some other symbols uh, whereas uh, back in the old days, it was just this, this simple red, green, and black. So just something to keep in mind when you're putting together your plots and things like that is that they'd be careful about which colors you pick. All right, getting back to the net logo here. So segregation model, you open that up and you say, well, what, what is this segregation model all about? Well, there's this guy named Thomas Schelling. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, well, I mean, technically a Nobel Memorial Prize in economic sciences. So um, he, um, he won the, the, um, the, the uh, what people colloquially call, call the Nobel in economics, even though it's not technically a pure Nobel. But, um, but so he's a very influential economist um, who was interested in studying conflict and cooperation through a number of analytical methods. Um, but this is before he really had access to a lot of the computational tools that we have now. And so we'll see how that comes into play here. So um, this model, this segregation model that he came up with, was focused on his observation that if you moved into areas of cities, you would find very large groups 
of people living next to each other, so highly segregated groups. But if you ever actually surveyed each individual person, then you'd find out that they, in theory, wouldn't actually care that much about how segregated they, they wouldn't say that they wanted to live in a segregated neighborhood. They might say that they have a small preference to live close to people a little bit like them, but they don't want to live in a neighborhood that's completely like them. And yet still the neighborhoods were turning out with these large groups of segregated areas. So um, the question was what, um, you know, what could be causing that, what process there. And so what Schelling, um, noticed in building this model was that you could have agents that actually didn't want to be that segregated that but due to a slight preference for being around other agents you'd end up getting um, these large-scale groups of segregation just just right out of the model that kind of were very consistent with the types of things that he um, represented so he, he talked about this this new general theory of tipping where you could have these like critical preferences that would cause systems to change and so on and so forth and and um, I won't get into too many details because you're going to experiment with that in the computer sim but the interesting thing is he didn't have a computer sim when he did it so what the way he did it is he took a bunch of dimes and pennies and he put them on graph paper and then those he would then say that, well, okay, I'm going to say, set up a rule that a dime wants to be close to, um, you know, roughly this many other dimes. And if it's not, it's going to, I'm going to move the dime into another area. And if it's happy, I'll leave it in the area. And if it's unhappy, I'll move it. And he manually moved the dimes and pennies around the graph paper. And uh, in the end, ended up coming up with, you know, showing that that he got these large groups of segregation, so a bunch of dimes together and a bunch of pennies together, but he did it all by hand, by moving dimes and pennies around graph paper, and that would be crazy. And uh, to to do if you know if you had a very large scale model and you wanted to understand like very minute details of how parameters could change these things, but fortunately the model that he was studying, um, what the 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 signals were so strong that he could do this with, um, you know, by hand and still actually get results out without having to run a whole lot of replications. But nowadays we have a computer, uh, you know, computer models like these engine-based models and NetLogo that can run large numbers of replications very quickly and we can get a much more detailed study of these phenomena. But I think it's just very interesting that he kind of really did it by hand. Uh, in as part of his research. It wasn't like he was learning how to do simulation like the way you guys started out by doing sims by hand. That was just the way that he did simulation. It was by hand. All right, so you open up the segregation model. Um, and let's see, like, so, you know, what is the segregation model all about? Well, um, you know, we know that we can go to this info tab and you can read all about it. So that's kind of a good thing to do is to kind of read about what this segregation model is and roughly how to use it. Um, and then they give you some tips on things to watch out for um, as you're, you're running the model. Um, and then they tell you a little bit about where it's from. So let's pop into the interface and, uh, and run it a couple of times. So I hit setup and I hit um, go. Now, um, you notice here that when I hit go, it eventually stopped. Now it won't always stop, um, it, you know, so I could, I could choose other percent similar wanteds here. So I might slide this like up pretty high and hit setup and uh, if I get lucky or unlucky, then I run this thing and it just seems to kind of run forever. And in fact, um, there will be some conditions of this model where it will run forever. So as I'm kind of reminding you in this section here, the process for this will be to adjust your parameters, click setup, click go, and then if necessary, you may have to click go again to kind of release the go to stop it early because these sims won't necessarily stop on their own. So that's a really kind of important part with this one. And this is the reason, one of the reasons why I'm not going to have you use behavior space with this one because um, there, because it, it doesn't naturally terminate and we don't know how long it is to run. So 
um, without a whole lot of extra investigation, we don't quite know how to set behavior space up to run this with the, the automated. So you're going to use um, do this, run your replications manually with this one, and we'll use behavior space for the next one. All right, so um, you're going to basically play with these sliders, density and percent similar wanted, doing this setup, running the go, watching things like this percent similar here, watching things like this percent unhappy. So you'll notice that when the percent unhappy hits zero, that's when the simulation naturally ends. Um, and then you can look up and you can say, well, when it ended, the percent similar were 55.7. So I can say when I set the percent similar wanted to 24% and I ran it, then um, I ended up converging to a percent similar of 55.7% and the, the sim naturally stopped. So I can sort of trust that that's an output here. It's not like a transient state. And then I could hit set up and run it again. And I might find that, um, that it, the simulation stops again and I might get a percent similar, which might be close to my other percent similar, but would be different because again, these are really stochastic simulations. And so the outputs may be different every time you run them. So that's the process you're going to kind of do by hand. And, um, and so once you're kind of comfortable with how it works, then I want you to go into the code tab. So we'll go back into your code here. And you can see how this code works. And so it's not very long, this code. And I'm not going to have you drill down too much into it. Um, so if you look up, it's got this thing's globals up top here, percent similar, percent unhappy. These kind of look like state variables, like you might see in uh, your discrete event system simulation. Kind of they, they, they represent the kind of global state of the world, but, um, but they just use them in here as kind of bookkeeping. So these are, are almost like the cumulative statistics that you might see in a, a hand simulation like we, we saw in chapter three if, uh, or in homework B1. Um, under turtle zone, so turtles, the, that's just the name of the agent type, the default agent type in NetLogo, and these are the attributes of each agent. So agents are the entities in agent-based models, and, um, and these agents have attributes like happy. Um, very often people choose, and this is just a convention, attributes that are only have two states, like zero or one or true or false, people put a question mark after them which just indicates that they are Boolean or binary attributes. Other attributes here, they've got similar nearby, which is how many neighboring patches have a turtle with a matching color. Other nearby, how many um, patches nearby have a turtle with a different color. And total nearby, which is just the sum of these. So these are all listed as attributes of this uh, entity, uh, the turtle agent. And, uh, and they change or can change potentially every step through the simulation. When you run this uh, setup, it runs this thing here and this is actually where the turtles are created. So you notice there's that density slider. If you look uh, carefully into here, then you can kind of, uh, you may be able to figure out how that works. They basically um, sprout, if you, uh, you can right click on sprout and then there's um, like show usage and quick help. Uh, or you can just go into the NetLogo dictionary and look up Sprout. But basically, Sprout uh, provides a way to create a single a agent, um, and, uh, and then you can, uh, on its creation, you can have it um, do a number, you know, a set of steps here. That um, in this case, it chooses a color and it makes the the visual size a certain size, and um, and so that's what happens when you hit setup. It ends, up, uh, it ends up sort of giving birth to all of the agents. And then uh, it runs these procedures, update turtles, update globals. It resets the clock to zero and then setup stops running. Every time you hit go, um, so when you hit go, go actually puts a little loop around where it then runs this over and over again. So this function only runs once, but the actual go button runs this function over and over and over again. And so um, there's a in this interface here, there's a go once, and if I were to click that, then that would actually just run this go routine once. But if I click go, this button's been configured, that's why it's got this little icon here, to run this go over and over and over again until you unclick go or until the simulation stops. 
And so inside here, this is where I want you to drill down to kind of figure out what's going on here. And, uh, and so you can, so the questions here, how does move unhappy turtles work? Well, you can see that that's the first, one of the first thing that's copy happens here in Go. I can go down to that routine, move unhappy turtles, and inside it, it calls find new spot. And if I look, find new spot, that's what I'm asking you about in the second question here. So um, I can go down and here's find new spot. So you can take a look at effectively these sort of three routines here and then try to use the NetLoader dictionary and to sort of decipher what is going on here to try to understand how uh, the sim is implementing the basic logic of the shelling segregation model. All right. So um, once you've looked at the code and feel pretty comfortable with that, we'll go back to the interface and we'll uh, run the sim. So in this case, I want you to um, uh, change the percent similar to a number of different values from 0 to 70 and from 70 to 100. And so explore this manually by just going in and changing them. So you can start at low, you can start at, you know, at, at 5%, hit setup, hit go, um, see what comes out. Um, you can try that again, see what comes out, so on and so forth, and then just keep moving that up. And you um, may need to make sure you hit setup, uh, so restart the sim, so make sure you hit setup every time you change that or else it won't actually make a difference. So then the things that I want you to try to answer is at what value of percent similar wanted does the aggregate percent similar actually reach 100%? So there is some value in here that if I were to hit setup and, um, and then hit go and let it run until it ended, then consistently this percent similar would read 100%. And so I'm wondering roughly where is that value? And sort of there's a hint here that um, it's actually not when percent similar is equal to 100%, it's somewhere lower than that. And so you know, trying to find whatever that is. And so that's the first question. And then uh, going along with that hint, what happens when you then try to put the percent similar wanted over that? So what happens to the percent similar? If you've already found the percent similar wanted that gives you 100% similarity, then what happens when you try to stress it even further and you say people want to be around people even more similar, uh, they, they want to be around more similar people, what's going to end up happening to the segregation? And um, so I think you know something kind of interesting ends up happening there when you push it over that threshold. And then the question three is to focus then on the other slider. So once you've gotten your kind of intuition about how percent similar wanted works, then change the density slider and see if it affects um, your interpretations as well. So do uh, what changes, if anything, if you change the density, hit setup, which obviously changes the density, and then you run your sim again, do you get different numbers? All right. Then um, for the second part, uh, we wanna open up a different model, even a much simpler model. So models library again, if we look back, I want you to look under Earth Science. So, Earth Science, and then Fire. And then here, this model has only got one slider, density. If I hit Setup, it basically instantiates a forest. If all these green things are trees that are of this density. So if I make the density very low and hit Setup, I get very few trees. I and set up, I get very many trees. So, and then if you look really closely, there's a bunch of red patches or red uh, agents um, down here. So nothing, um, agents don't move in this simulation, but what actually happens is the agents are take on different states. And so an agent can either be burning, so it's bright red, or it can be unburned, it's just a tree, um, it's green, um, or it can be an ember, so it is previously burned and now it is a, a sort of a burnt tree. And if a burning tree is near um, an unburning tree, then that fire will spread to that tree. So 
the fire is moving, but really it's moving in that stationary agents are changing their state based on them being sort of infected from fire from other stationary air agents near them. So what does that look like? Well, if I hit go, um, effectively the simulation lights the left side of the forest on fire and you get a fire that kind of spreads in. But if the trees are far enough apart, there's sort of a barrier and uh, the fire can't spread very far. But if you bring the, um, the trees uh, closer together by increasing that density and then light this fire, then you see that the fire can actually penetrate far into the forest. Unlike the previous simulation, the segregation model, this sim is guaranteed to end. It'll um, either end when all of the trees are burned or when the fire gets stuck and doesn't have anywhere else to spread to. So you'll see that in this particular case, the fire manages to get all the way across the forest, but it doesn't burn all the trees. So some of these clumps of trees were managed to end up being protected by the fire. So, but still it burned a lot of trees. So it finally finished here and it says that there, there's 96% of the forest got burnt in that condition. So if I go to some other condition and run it, um, you know, this only 0.6% only got burnt in this condition. So um, if I run this over and over again, then I'll get different numbers out here. And that's kind of going to end up being the point here. So what, um, uh, you know, so again, I recommend that you go into the info tab, read through how this, uh, what this is and how it works. Um, so it mentions sort of here the mechanism of fire spreading. And then, um, it, like I was saying, the, the big difference in this sim is that we will always wait for the simulation to stop. So you don't have to uncheck that go midway. And then, um, so because I'm going to have to use behavior space, we need uh, reporters. And so that percent burned will be something that we actually want behavior space to grab for us. And so what we do is we go into the interface and we right click on percent burned, go into edit, and then we can see the formula that they used. And so it's just the burned trees global divided by initial trees. And uh, that gives them a fraction, they multiply it by a 100. So what I'm gonna do is just copy that formula because I'm gonna need it in behavior space a little bit later. So now let's open up behavior space. So again, I do that by going tools, and then I go to behavior space. And then I create a new experiment. And in this new experiment, I only have this one slider, so I only have one variable showing up here. And so um, what I want to do is turn off measure runs at every step. And I want to make sure the time limit set to zero, which means it doesn't have any time limit, because I'm confident that this sim will naturally end. And so I'm just going to let it run every single time. Now that reporter that we copied that's what I want to, I'm going to get rid of this count turtles and I need to put this in one line. So I'm going to hit backspace to bring that up here. And this will be the thing that actually ends up getting um, uh, reported um, at the end of every replication. So um, in other words, um, every time it runs, it's going to read this reporter here. And it's going to save that value to a spreadsheet and then do another run and then it'll save a new value to the spreadsheet. So this is actually the data that we end up being saved out. So now we just need to decide how many runs. So we need to go up with the density here. And so this is where um, you can either put, I want to say, well, I want to run density 10, 30, 40, 70, and 100. Um, or you could say I want to run a range. And I want them to maybe start with five and go in steps of uh, 10 all the way up to 100. You know, that's another way you could do. So this will sort of be up to you, but you need to do some range there. So, um, uh, so we'll see that uh, in a second in the question. But once you choose your ranges here, then you'll uh, choose your number of replications. And I think I'm asking you to do at least 10. So if I were to hit OK here, then it would save an experiment that um, only runs 10 replications. But if I were to say, all right, I want to do 20 uh, density of 20 and density of 30 because I have two densities, 
and 10 replications each, then it'll tell me, well, it's now gonna run 20 simulation runs because it'll be 10 for this one and 10 for this one, okay? So um, after you set up all of that, click OK, and that will bring you back to the experiment here. And like you can see, it says it's gonna run 210 runs. Well, that meant that um, when I set this up, when I was making this slide presentation, I must have used a density that had 21 different densities. So I probably used a range that had 21 densities. And then for each density, it ran 10 runs. And so 21 times 10 gave me 210. And that's, you know, so this experiment will run, will run this automatically for me 210 times, adjusting the density parameter as needed. Now, if you try to run that by clicking this run down here, it will pop up a dialog um, asking you what type of output you want. And the weird thing is we do not want the so-called spreadsheet output because it is just a worthless way of structuring data. Um, we want to instead turn on this so-called table output. The table output structures data in kind of a way that sort of makes sense where um, every column it sort of either stores an input variable or an output variable, and every row um, is sort of the outcome of a single simulation run. So, um, you know, you can kind of, uh, if you run more simulation runs, it just adds more rows, and it ends up being very easy to work with. When you click OK, it's then going to ask you, where do you want to save it? And so you then choose a file name, and it's going to save in a CSV format. So if you're not familiar with CSV, that's comma separated values. Um, so that's just a text format for storing spreadsheets. So you can actually open up a, the CSV file in Microsoft Excel after the simulations are, fi are finished. And like I was just saying, um, every column will either be your, your independent variable, like density, or your dependent variable, which is your response variable, which is that percent burn that comes out. And every row is an actual replication uh, from uh, a simulation run. So what I want you to do for this one is um, plot the relationship between density and percent burn. So you can either plot the raw data, so like a scatter plot, um, or an average. So uh, what I mean by that is in your spreadsheet, you're going to, because you have at least 10 replications, then you'll have one density repeated 10 times that have 10 different outputs. Well, you could just plot um, all of the densities with their corresponding outputs. And for uh, in the scatter plot, if density is on your horizontal axis, then you'll end up getting sort of a, a cluster of, um, you know, a group of outputs hovering around one of your densities and then another group of outputs hovering around the other density and so on and so forth. And from that scatter plot, you can see what sort of pattern there is there. Alternatively, if um, you can uh, also just summarize the, you know, for a particular density, if there's 10 points, you can replace them with the average across those 10 and then just plot the averages. So you can say the, the average for when the density is uh, one value, the average in the density is another value, the average in the density is another value, and you see is there a particular pattern in the averages. So that's what Q4A is, is to plot it, and Q4B, I want you to look at that and then tell me if you think it's linear or nonlinear. By linear, do, do, that would mean that if you, it, roughly speaking, if you doubled the density, do you double the percent burn? Um, nonlinear would be um, that maybe you double the density and the percent burned doesn't change in a very predictable way. It might stay constant unless your density goes over a particular threshold. And over that threshold, then um, the percent burned might, you know, run up to a, a very large value. So is it more nonlinear, where it has these abrupt changes, or linear, where it moves smoothly with the input variable? And then in the bonus, um, and I mentioned something about this before, if you actually were to look at the code for this fire spreading, so if I go to code here, um, this is uh, you know, even shorter than the, the previous one. Um, in every step through, it basically asks, the, so it has these, these fires. And so um, 
fires is a, a breed. So this is a, an example of where you can name the entities um, different things. And so there's, there's some of the entities are embers and some of the entities are fires. Um, and uh, so it's, it asks all of the fires, all of those entities that are on fire, to look at their neighbors. And their neighbors, this neighbors four, just looks at the neighbors to the north, east, south, and west. So it doesn't look at all of the neighbors. And if any of those neighbors are green, which means they haven't been ignited yet, then it ignites them. And, um, and then after they're ignited, um, then it turns their breed from uh, a fire to an ember, which means they can't get ignited again. And this is totally deterministic. So this means that if there is a fire, then definitely all of the neighbors that are not on fire yet will be on fire. So because this is a deterministic rule, you might think that every time I run the sim, I will get the exact same output. And yet, when you run the sim with the same parameters, you don't get the same output. So my question is, if the update rule is totally deterministic, why are the outputs random? So where is the source of randomness in the model? And that's what I'm sort of saying right here in the bonus question. So to summarize everything, part one, open up the segregation model, take a look at the code, try to describe how it works, play with the model, and see how the percent similar wanted variable relates to the actual percent similar um, that the system converges to. And, um, and then also the, the number unhappy, um, how, um, how if you were to set the percent similar wanted very high, um, then how would that affect the percent similar and the number unhappy? And, uh, and then also play with density and see if density changes your results any. Then for the forestry model, I want you to determine with the simulation whether the density of the forest is linearly or non-linearly related to the percent burned after a fire event. And if you're doing this in the lab, then there would be a ticket out assignment. Um, so if you are not doing this uh, in the lab, if this is an online lab for you, then, uh, then you may have to answer some questions after this lecture about the lecture. And that will sort of count as your ticket out. But there isn't, of course, sort of some like in-class ticket out because it's all online. And that's all that I have for you for, uh, for this lab. So I hope you enjoy uh, trying out NetLogo.